Hi everybody, uh, you're very welcome tonight to the uh, Institute of Irish Studies and to this talk on uh, Beyond the Troubles, Politics and Placemaking in Northern Ireland. And uh, obviously this is topical given what's happened in the last week and we're going to have the Assembly back on Saturday but I'm not really sure the people who will be in the Assembly will know how to build a proper socially just economy but I'm sure uh, Liz and uh, Ellie, Ellie will be able to talk about that. And also, thank you very much to Sue from the Hesitant Institute, who's going to... I got it right, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I usually call Sue Liz for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, name badges need to be supplied. So, so thank you very much for coming out tonight uh, and uh, hear something a bit different from what we usually do. I think that's really important. And last night, Jerry and I were in, in that London, as you Scousers call it, and we were hosting an event uh, with 14 emerging female artists and uh, in, in the Hammersmith Irish Centre, if you go to London, please go and see the exhibition. It's really, really good. And we were just thinking last night and talking, you know, those of us of a certain generation uh, remember our grandmothers telling them about the first time they were able to vote. Like that's, that's, that's a living memory for many of us. And of course, uh, you know, one of the things that will be talked about tonight is elites, economic elites. But I think what's also important is you know, within the Institute, we, we, in the last 10 years, we made a big effort to shift from having very few women who were part of uh, art exhibitions or spit talks, etc., and, and to reverse that. And I think there's still a ceilings upon uh, women's inclusion in society. But uh, the thing is, nothing's going to change unless we have events like this and we map this out. So these two, Ellie and uh, Liz, have the great misfortune that I supervise them. And... Uh, uh, Liz was the 23rd PhD I had got across the line, and Ellie was the 24th. I know there are other supervisors, etc. And I think I've done enough of that now. I think I should just step back and let somebody else do it. But uh, tonight is important, and it is important that we have conversations about that place, which is called Northern Ireland. And I think one of the things that we shall come up tonight is how new is Northern Ireland? And I, and I think that's something which is critically important, because if we're ever going to achieve a socially just society in Northern Ireland, it has to be a lot further down the road than where it is today. So I shall now hand over to Sue. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Pete, for that. I'll just adjust the mic and um, just like to welcome everybody um, for tonight's book launch. Um, Dr. Elizabeth de Young's book, Power, Politics and Territory in the New Northern Ireland. So as Pete said, I'm, I'm Sue Jarvis. I'm from the Heseltine Institute for Public Policy and Practice and delighted to be co-hosting this event with um, Irish Studies. Um, for those who don't know the Heseltine Institute, we focus on the development of sustainable and inclusive cities and city regions. So it fits very neatly with some of the discussion that we'll hear tonight. Before we get started, just um, to cover some housekeeping. So as far as we're aware, there's not going to be a fire alarm tonight. So if the alarm does go out, go off, we need to just go outside and follow the guidance. Um, I think you've probably all found where the toilets are again outside um, their sign posted. Can I ask people to switch off the mobile phones as well, please, just so we don't interrupt the discussion? And also just to let everybody know that we're actually recording the discussion today and we'll be posting that on the website for Irish Studies and the Heseltine Institute if you want to go back and, and listen again or, or share with other colleagues. So that, that moves me on to, to the book. Um, and as Pete says, it's very timely um, given this week's news um, that the Stormont executive is being restored. So in terms of the book, um, in the wake of the Good Friday Agreement, the development of the former Girdwood Barracks in North Belfast was hailed as a symbolic, was aimed as, hailed as a symbol of hope for the Northern Ireland peace process. And it was a major investment in a conflict zone, securing £11.7 million from the EU to tackle ec economic deprivation and housing needs. And it was considered an internationally significant peace building project. But after 11 years of negotiation, trade-offs and contention, as you'll hear later, the Girdwood Community Hub opened its doors to the public in 2016. And the impact has been underwhelming and has served to reinscribe long-standing divisions and equalities in the local area. So what the book does is it traces the redevelopment process from start to finish 
and it really is a metaphor for the peace process and the collapse of governance in Northern Ireland. And using ethno, ethno, I can never say this word, ethno, ethnography <laughs> and encounter, the book will bring readers behind the scenes of the decision-making processes in Northern Ireland and it offers what could be described as a somewhat uncomfortable critique of how policy and planning fail to deliver. So it provides a powerful reminder of the ways that political and economic forces can shape space in cities around the world and it offers some theoretical and empirical <coughs> contributions to the concept of contested space. So alongside studies, um, students of Irish studies, this is really something for the geographers, social scientists and urbanists out there. I think you'll all find that there's something really interesting to hear from the discussion. So the format that we're doing tonight is an in conversation um, and we'll have Liz and El Eleanor who are both former PhD students at the Institute who are going to talk through the book. So first of all, welcome back to Liverpool. <laughs> In terms of the short biography of, of both of our speakers, Dr. Elizabeth de Jong is a research scientist and lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, where she co-leads research initiatives on basic income at a national scale. And prior to that, as mentioned, she, she holds a PhD from the Institute of Irish Studies here at, in Liverpool. Dr. Eleanor Perrin is currently an ESRC postdoctoral fellow at Queen's University Belfast and is researching cooperatives, cooperative ec economies and alternative economic practices in Northern Ireland. So in terms of the format for the rest of the, this evening, we'll have the discussion and then we'll, we've built in some time so we can have some Q&A from the audience as well so you can participate. So what we're aiming to do is look at the local place-based pe perspective of the Girdwood development and then see how it's situated in that wider context of placemaking, of development and of territorial contest. So the conversation over the next 30 minutes is going to actually cover three specific topics. Firstly, what does this mean in terms of urban planning and neoliberal peace building in a post-conflict city? Secondly, we'll take a look at ethno-sectarian identity politics versus social justice. And we'll finish off with some reflections on the methods that we used, particularly around the benefits and challenges of developing community-led regeneration and how translating this type of research into impactful policy um, plays out. So I will hand over now to the discussion. I think, Eleanor, you're going to kick us off I'll, I'll well, let Lise, uh, maybe say I, I just wanted to say, is this, this all right? Um, thank you all so much for coming this evening. Um, it's so lovely to be back in the place where you know, I did my doctoral research. Thanks so much to the Institute of Irish Studies, Viola, Jerry, Pete, for having me back again to Sue for chairing and to uh, Dr. Ellie Perrin, um, a, a dear friend and a scholar whose research practice I truly admire. So. Looking forward to our conversation today. Oh, thanks, Liz. So we're going to drop the academic formalities, if you don't mind, because Liz and I have known each other for more than 10 years now. Um, so it's just going to be Liz and Ellie. And please feel free to just you know, refer to us in, in these terms. Um, and I actually met Liz many years ago in a pub in Belfast, one of the pubs, that famous pub she writes about in her book, you know, <laughs> as we were <laughs> living the life <laughs> you know, many moons ago. And so it's, it's kind of an honor for me and I feel really proud and also incredibly grateful to be here today um, because she was doing her research on Girdwood at the Times and we we're going to talk about Girdwood and I wasn't actually thinking of resuming my studies but it was such an inspiration for me to do research on Northern Ireland. I had lived in Northern Ireland and worked in Northern Ireland so it's just such a moment, you know, full round circle now. Um, which brings me to this book. I mean, you know, it's not every day one publishes a book, so it's a, it's a fantastic book as well. And we'll go into this as a conversation to try and kind of, you know, untie a few things around it. It's very difficult to talk about politics in Northern Ireland without being too cynical or too critical at times, despite the fact that obviously the peace process has saved many lives. But at the same time, we have a, a duty and a requirement, I think, as scholars to look at the shortfalls of the peace process 
if we want to create avenues for real, genuine post-conflict transformation and for social justice. And for me, this book does that brilliantly, you know, because it's a constructive engagement with the politics and the discourses of post-peace agreement Northern Ireland, with the policy practices, with the planning, and all of this through looking at one single case study, which is the Girdwood Barracks in North Belfast. So I'll kick off with a question on this, which is, you know, what is Girdwood? Uh, what was the original vision for Girdwood? And especially, you know, this is a project that emerged in the infant years of the peace process. So what was the hope for it? Yeah, so I, I literally stumbled upon Girdwood. Um, I, I arrived in Belfast when I was 20 years old, and I used to walk <coughs> everywhere. I walked for hours on end, you know, up the Shankill and down the falls and through the cemeteries, um, haunted a, a couple of those pubs that Ellie mentioned. I went everywhere. I wore out probably a dozen pairs of Doc Martens. And in doing so, I, I got really lost all the time. And I was really lost one day in North Belfast, which is, is, is not often visited by researchers. Um, and I kept running into this metal barrier. I couldn't figure it out. It wasn't, it wasn't a peace wall, as these interface barriers between communities are often referred to. Um, and it really, I just, I couldn't get across. The other thing that I noticed about the area was it was very eerie. It was only 10 minutes from city center, but there was no life to the area. There was no movement. Um, and I was really curious. This, this area just, it stuck with me. And so I ended up knocking on the doors of, of several community groups and asking them about this metal barrier and what it meant and, and why, was, why, why was the land there. And so I stumbled, literally stumbled upon this topic, which became my master's thesis, my doctoral work, and now this book. Um, and what I found out was that the site that I had stumbled upon was the old Girdwood Army Barracks. And if you, if you move to the... Uh, and it's really, it's, it's located in a really interesting spot because it's right on one of those peace walls that I referred to. You can literally walk from one side of the other, from a Protestant Unionist neighborhood to a Catholic Nationalist one. And it functions essentially as a buffer zone if you're looking at it as a geographer. You have the army barracks right in the middle, and then you have four highly segregated neighborhoods. Um, you can see here, this is a GIS map, so it doesn't quite reflect the boundaries that, that many people from Belfast might know, but just to give you a sense, on the one side you have the Catholic Nationalist New Lodge and Lower Cliftonville, and on the other side the Protestant Unionist Lower Old Park and Lower Shankill. Um, these neighborhoods are all divided by a variety of barriers, and what they all have in common is they're extremely disinvested, multiply deprived, and uh, suffered heavily from the conflict. Um, the the Girdwood Barracks was also, I mean, it was an army barracks, so, you know, these places were surveilled. Um, it was the m main site of conflict during the Troubles. Uh, so, so actually a really important site, although not much has been done on it. Um, and so initially, when the peace process commenced and the Good Friday Agreement was signed, um, the barracks were demilitarized, and all, you know, as part of several of these barracks being demilitarized across Northern Ireland. And there was so much optimism about this patch of land. This was, this was 27 acres, as I mentioned, in a multiply divided and deprived locality. And the idea was, you know, there's so much potential here. What can we do with it? Um, so a lot of optimism around the transformative potential of this site you know, symbolically as a former army barracks becoming an opportunity for transformative peace building and reconciliation, but also as a resource for uh, communities that really needed it. You know, you had high un unemployment, mental health crisis, and a housing crisis in this part of North Belfast. So, um, yeah, the sky was really the limit with Girdwood. And that didn't work out, did it? I mean. In your book, you kind of mention this as a missed opportunity, as a white elephant. Um, and even, you know, to quote you, you know, you, you kind of said this was a fudge and unsatisfactory compromise that neither targeted social and economic need, nor meaningfully transformed the interface. So it sounds like a sad state of affairs, really, when you look at it. Yeah, so, so it, took, it took 11 years and 11.7 million pounds of European Union peace money uh, to eventually redevelop this site. Um, it took two different phases. 
um, pre-economic crash, uh, there was a lot of optimism around the site as well because you had investment coming into Northern Ireland. And so the idea was you could create a mixed use site. Um, the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland was actually, um, there was a tender for that to be cited on the space. Um, but the issue of social housing stalled all plans for the development and it ended up falling victim to identity politics really between um, the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, which was the main unionist um, political party in Northern Ireland, and Sinn Féin, the main nationalist uh, political party. And so the, the site lay vacant for years and this was the site that I had stumbled on. Um, and then there was a, a second phase of the development which was funded by that EU Peace 3 money and it was for a community hub. And um, if, you, if you just go, I think, to the next slide. Um, before, at phase one of the plans, they, they had an architect come in. There were some really interesting kind of ideas about transforming the space. It all went quiet. Uh, the second master plan, which you can see here, was devised by the DUP and, the, and Sinn Féin um, for this community center and then there would be, um, you can see there's housing towards the nationalist Catholic side of the development, another round of housing for the Protestant Unionist side. You had literally like two parking lots. You had all this land here for a sports pitch, all this land for mixed use space. But it's really clumsy from a planning perspective and it really reflects really a sectarian carve up of resources that each side got a little bit of the site. You had this leisure center just kind of put in the middle uh, there were already a lot of leisure centers in the area. Um, it's worth noting there were already plenty of playing fields. So it really wasn't anything that the communities around the site needed or had envisioned for themselves. Um, I was talking to, you know, during my field work, I, I met all kinds of people that were involved in the redevelopment process. And I met a planner, a really brilliant planner, who was talking about this site. And he showed me these plans and he was like, a toddler could have done this, you know, it's so simplistic and it really ended up only reinscribing those physical and um, sectarian divisions that were already present in this contested landscape. Uh, so I argue, I'm quite critical of the Girdwood Hub in the book, that it really is a white elephant. It's, it's a place that it doesn't fit, it doesn't stitch together the surrounding neighborhoods from a planning perspective. And I, I go visit it every time I'm back in Belfast, and it's always empty. There's a leisure center, there's a, there's a gym that you can subscribe in and you know, use the gym facilities. But it really, it's just, it's, it's a missed opportunity. It's, it's a waste of what could have been really good, um, a really good development. And the other thing I'll say that really is the crux of all of this is the issue of social housing. So, you know, as I said, this was 27 acres of land and North Belfast had, had been and continues to experience a really severe housing crisis. And so, you know, at varying points in the development, it was like, you know, this is a perfect, a perfect opportunity to build social housing for people that desperately need it. Um, and at the end, only 60 units of social housing were put on those, on those acres. Um, and so that, that is a huge part of the Girdwood story, this issue of social housing. I mean, as you said, so social housing is the kind of main point of contention between Sinn Féin and the DUP and kind of all of the actors in the process. And so could you tell us more about the rhetoric around it? But I think another question that I have with that is when I was reading the book, at some point you talk about gerrymandering. Um, and I kind of, you know, was a bit shocked when I was reading this because, you know, the kind of systemic discrimination in housing and employment in political representation, these were part of the main roots of the conflict in the first place of the troubles. So to hear about gerrymandering during, for example, the ministry uh, of McCoslin when he was in social development and all of this kind of nipping in the bud of several social housing projects, not just Girdwood, in North Belfast, I think in, in a way, does it not speak to a failure of obviously power sharing politics in Northern Ireland, but also of the peace process itself, you know? Yeah, absolutely. There's so much that I could, I could say about this social housing issue. Um, and just to provide a little bit of framing, a little bit of context um, at the time, so the DUP and Sinn Féin were partners in power sharing. And um, so I suppose with, with unionism, there, at, at the time in North Belfast, there was this issue of territory and contest because you had this, this demographic shift at the time, whereby predominantly unionist neighborhoods in North Belfast 
were declining. They were experiencing, you know, a loss of population. And this was reflected in the physical environment. You know, in my walks, I would see whole streets of derelict houses and vacant space. And so quite a dispiriting environment to live in. Um, so you have that on the one side. And then on the other side, you have the nationalist Catholic population of North Belfast, which experiences overcrowding, you know, right up houses right up to the peace line. Um, a real need for housing there because the demographics were, were increasing. And it's worth noting at the time that the DUP held electoral control of North Belfast by a thread. You know, they, they were really hanging on. And so at several points in the Girdwood development, there was this idea that if you build houses on the Girdwood site, it's not only going to be an encroachment of territory because new build houses will likely house nationalist Catholics given the concentration of the housing waiting list, but it also means more potential votes um, for the nationalist Catholic side rather than the DUP. And so at every turn, the DUP blocked social housing on this land. And so, you know, I argue in the book, um, this really just goes against everything that the, the prescriptions of the peace process had recommended and that were enshrined in legislation through the Northern Ireland Act. Um, it was not the most thrilling of my research methodologies to, to to go through all of these policy documents with a fine tooth comb. But um, there is this one key piece of legislation, Section 75, which specifically held politicians to equality of opportunity. And so providing resources to people that needed them, regardless of ethno, religious background, a variety of other kind of groupings. Um, but they, so this, this development completely ignored Section 75 because there was a clear and documented need for housing on this site. Um, thousands of people on the waiting list, and they, they just didn't build enough. Um, and it was because of these identity politics, because of this kind of territorial contest um, and resource sharing, the zero sum, you know, housing for you, housing for me, a parking lot for you, you know, it, it was all just completely under road by that tit for tat mentality. And so in, while I loved looking at the Girdwood site because it was full of dysfunction and really served as this, as this incredibly interesting case study on its own, I think you know, the broader import of this work and of the book is, is it, it really is a perfect microcosm of, of the peace process and how you know, power sharing between the DUP and Sinn Féin failed in the end because it was just enshrined in this constant battle, this zero-sum battle for resources and territory rather than looking at, okay, how can we improve people's quality of life and you know, engage in the, the prescriptions of the peace process. And it's interesting because this kind of sectarian carve up of territory and you know, uh, kind of ethno-national ethno resource competition is something that may seem very unique to Northern Ireland. You know, and obviously this a geography of segregation that we see in Belfast, again, seems very unique. But there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn with kind of planning and urban development elsewhere. And you touch upon a little bit on the kind of entrepreneurialism uh, with those regeneration projects as well. But I'd be interesting, interested in asking you, you, what do you think are the lessons and how do they relate to how we understand the mechanisms that inform planning elsewhere, not just in Northern Ireland? Yeah, I think, I think it's so easy, and I certainly fall prey to this sometimes. It's so easy to think of Belfast as, and Northern Ireland as a place apart uh, because it's, you know, there's so many peculiarities to the way that space is used and perceived there. But really, you know, as somebody who loves studying cities and the way they're planned and organized, we, we can see parallels um, in the Girdwood case study anywhere. Because if you think, you know, I think space always reflects the powers that produce it. And so in every city, you have segregation and division uh, by race, by class. Um, certainly, you know, when I first, when I finished my PhD and I moved home to the States, I was like, what am I going to do? You know, how am I going to, how am I going to like think about this here in the States? And clearly, you know, every city in the States is, is extremely segregated because of a legacy of very intentional policies around redlining and you know, denying black people mortgages or the ability to own homes in white areas. And that has in turn created this legacy that, that reflects physically in high wealth and low wealth areas in the states. Um, I live in Philadelphia and it's incredibly divided. Um, you, know, you, can, you, can go your whole, you can go your whole day without kind of moving from one neighborhood to the other. It's, it's really stark. So there's certainly division in the states. Um, and I think in terms of 
you know, these types of planning policies, uh, we think of urban renewal, and that's taken place in the UK, US, you can see it in Liverpool, where there was this idea of, you know, let's, let's do slum clearance and let's build a motorway through predominantly working class areas. Um, and that rips the fabric of the city in a different way because you're privileging the desires of, you know, commuters who live in towns outside the city. And um, in turn, you're also creating this kind of, uh, in, in Belfast, I think of it as an economic interface because you have the city center and then you've got the motorway and then you've got west, north and east Belfast who are, who are then physically, you know, separated from that relative prosperity of the center. Um, so I think, you know, if you're thinking about the dynamics of how power shapes space and how capital shapes space, uh, I think there's certainly a lot of parallels, um, you know, with this case study. Brilliant. I think another concept as well, which is going to apply not just to Northern Ireland, is the concept of community. And I mean, you kind of touch on that a little bit where, you know, you look at community participation and there's such a turn you know, in urban development now looking at, you know, consultation with the community, community participation. Um, and it was interesting that you moved, you know, you, you kind of shifted the focus of your study from the policy and the institutional level to also work with local actors on the ground and civil society organizations. But what I find interesting is that it offers conceptual developments to what do we mean by community? Because community is such a kind of trope of a concept, you know, it's a feel good, used and abused term that can mean so many different things. And especially in a Northern Irish context, but not only. So who is the community in Girdwood in particular? And what is the community? Yeah, I think, I think in urban planning and regeneration generally too, you always hear about like working with community and it really is such a feel good term. Um, and I think it's, it's definitely overused and it's certainly overused in the context of Northern Ireland. So something, you know, I was really keen to do was to, to dive into this notion of community and disentangle it and say, what are we really talking about when we talk about communities? Because, you know, in Belfast, there's geographical communities, there's neighborhoods, um, and even within those, when I, you know, when I would walk, for instance, I, I could pass like 12 different micro neighborhoods who all would maybe go under the banner of one community. Um, and within those, I'm just going to keep like using the quotation marks, um, within those communities, there's such a range of people. You have gatekeepers, you have, in, in Belfast, you have paramilitary gatekeepers, you have particular community development groups who might be connected with politicians and receiving more funding. Um, some people term these kind of things the, the peace industry, whereby some, you know, some people are more placed to speak for others um, in the community, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, looking at all of those nuances, you then have people that live in those same geographical areas who want nothing to do with the paramilitaries or the community development groups, and they're like, they don't speak for me. Um, and then, you know, in Northern Ireland, you have this tip, you have this dichotomy, this binary of like, you know, thinking about community as unionist or nationalist, um, Catholic, Protestant. But really, in Northern Ireland, there, there's a multiplicity of, of groups and people who don't define themselves along those, li those lines. You have, you know, people from immigrants from all over who have lived in Northern Ireland for decades. Um, you have a more recent influx of asylum seekers and refugees who call Northern Ireland home. And, you know, we were talking about this. You have trade unionists, you have punks, you have all kinds of people who don't subscribe to this binary. So. Um, that's, that's kind of a, a rambling way of talking about the, these rabbit holes I found myself uh, looking at when we talk about the notion of community in, in Belfast, particularly as it pertains to regeneration and, uh, you know, the community has a, a say in this. We'll still keep using community even if we know it's a Yeah, we're going to say it like a million times tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and moving on to maybe methodology and the kind of methodological contributions. Um, this is obviously a very academically robust, you know, detailed, thorough piece of work. But it's also an amazing read. It's a fantastic read as a book. And I think, you know, you kind of really walk us literally, you know, through the city, through those divided neighborhoods, um, those deprived neighborhoods. You know, we pass kind of concrete walls and open mesh fences and so on. And you touch upon as well some of the kind of cultural aspects um, of living in this city, you know, the, the slang, the banter and so on. And as someone who's lived in Northern Ireland and worked in Northern Ireland for a long time, even if I'm not from Northern Ireland, very clearly you can hear from my accent, it's something that even 
I know, but I don't really f reflect on it. It's something that's usually kind of taken for granted um, and escapes kind of academic scrutiny. It's very interesting that you provide this very rich, multifaceted portrait of the city. Um, but what, you know, what made you kind of decide for an ethnographic approach, which obviously provides that, especially when a lot of the research on regeneration in Northern Ireland, whether you're looking at Tribeca, Belfast, or the Titanic Quarter, usually does not use such qualitative methods. So why ethnography? Yeah, I've always struggled to define myself dis discipli oh, this, disciplinarily, um, <laughs> because I feel like I really draw from a lot of different fields. But, um, you know, I've, I've always loved walking, as you all know now. And uh, I felt, for me, I felt like being physically present and moving through these neighborhoods was the first step to understanding them. Because it's only through walking and being physically present that, that you learn the nuances of a, a place and what it's like to live there and move through it. What it's like to try to traverse, you know, uh, different neighborhoods and be stopped by a wall or to be lost and to be, you know, be kind of unsure of where you're going. Um, I, also, I found it fascinating to use my walks and my, my kind of movement through space as a way to trace this place over time because, as you know, you know, murals evolve. Um, the way that people engage with uh, memory and memorializing space evolves. Um, the, the built environment really, I think, reflects uh, the people that live there, the people that hold power there. You know, uh, for instance, the Girdwood Community Hub. I remember walking uh, down the street shortly before it opened, and there were three new paramilitary plaques on the wall ac across from it, just as kind of like a you know, a, a nod to who had power in the area. So, so if you pay attention, and I think this isn't just a Belfast thing, this is something I do in my own research, uh, my current research, where I, I travel around the states uh, looking at this idea of basic income. And it's impossible, you know, I, I can't spend years in these cities, you know, working with people as I did in Belfast, but the first thing I always do is go for a walk because I think it's the first way to understand a place. And so that was really my first step pardon the pun, I have, to, I have to get it in there, um, to, my, to my research methods. And I was also really fortunate to, you know, work alongside in my research um, community groups in the area. And that was, that was something that took a lot of time. And I'm, I'm, it was through their generosity and their opening their worlds to me that I was able to attend, you know, dozens and dozens of community meetings and council meetings and tag along on, you know, community fun days. I drank like a, a, a million cups of tea with everyone. And um, so, so people really did open their worlds to me. And that, that, you know, I think was a really wonderful part of the research just to be able to listen and observe. I've always been like a fly on the wall kind of person that just sits back and, and takes in the scene. And so, yeah, that was a part of my, my research as well. And then, of course, all of the, all of the pouring over policy, because, uh, you know, I, I did all of these ethnographic field notes and writings and, and observations, but then to, to cross-reference those and to support them with policy work was, was another one of my aims. But um, I really enjoyed the, the being, being in Belfast the most and wanted to do it justice in my writing, because it's, it's a brilliant place. It's full of creative people, so I wanted to, to do that justice. I think you talk about like doing this justice and there's something as well about delivering impact, you know, especially for the people you've worked with, trying to kind of write in a way which rings true to their activism, especially, especially those kind of local actors, the community groups, and also, you know, portray their real predicaments on the ground. And I wonder whether there's something about kind of community research where, you know, you are engaged, you're embedded, and therefore you're a lot more <coughs> accountable. You know, it's trying to move away from extractive forms of research. Is that something, you know, that was important for you? Yeah, I think, you know, I think coming from the academic perspective, there, there's a lot of problems when we talk about researching with communities because there's the danger of researching on communities. And even, you know, being on the ground, so to speak, in Belfast, you know, there, there's a sense sometimes that you're a voyeur, you're an outsider, you're coming here and you're writing up notes on people's lives and then you're leaving and writing your papers. And I think there can be a tradition, particularly in anthropology, but in other disciplines of this helicopter style research where you go in and you do your interviews and you leave and you never go back and that's and you write your papers and you know I disagree with that approach and it's something that I sought very much to avoid in my work and 
just to, to be genuine, like I, I did this research because I cared so deeply about piecing together the story of Girdwood, and I cared about recording the clear injustices that were happening from a political level, and, and in some instances, you know, among community members. But I wanted, I really cared about recording that injustice. And um, I felt that, I felt that was received. I also felt, you know, you know, zooming ahead a couple years when, when this book was published recently and figuring out, okay, well, well now what do I do with the book? Because um, it's, it's an academic book and so it's priced for institutions. It's not necessarily priced for the individual to read. And so that was something that I was trying to figure out how to, to tackle because I wanted everyone that I worked with to be able to access this book because they had helped so much in, in its, its creation. So, you know, I, I made sure I gave copies to everyone I worked with and everyone I interviewed. Um, and I was also really fortunate to reconnect with a group who, during the Girdwood development process, this group, they're called Participation in the Practice of Rights. And during the whole sorry Girdwood process, they were really like the only voice of reason at the time. Um, and I, I, had, I had really admired their approach to the development because it was a real example of community engagement that was human rights based and non-sectarian. And so anyway, um, reconnected with them and they were really excited about the book coming out because of what had happened at Girdwood and the missed opportunity. And so if you just um, change the slide to the last one, I think. And so they've continued researching um, along with many other brilliant uh, grassroots activism groups in Belfast. They've continued uh, campaigning on a new site which is called Mackey's in West Belfast. And this is similar to Girdwood, a huge parcel of land that uh, is public land, perfect for public housing ostensibly, but um, received EU funding and they put a greenway on it. No social housing on Mackey's. Uh, but PPR with the, the Take Back the City campaign has been campaigning around this land and making some really interesting headway and progress and creating some really exciting plans for the site. So I reconnected with them and they've been so brilliant in supporting the book and hopefully creating some momentum around the work that's still ongoing around housing justice. And so, you know, I hope that this book can serve as a resource for those who are able to read and access it, but I also hope that it serves as a catalyst for conversation around the fact that this kind of housing injustice is still happening in Belfast and shining a light on the work that is still ongoing um, to, to, to address those, those injustices. Mm -hmm. And your next book, maybe, The Mackies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next research. Um, one final question, and then you know, we'll open it up, obviously, to the floor. Uh, as we know, you know, we're going to now have a, an assembly again in Northern Ireland. Um, we've heard so this, I hear. We've, yeah. we've heard from a secret, not so secret meeting on Monday night. Um, and, you know, in, in the case, I'm kind of, you know, thinking about the future here, but also in the case of, case of Gerd, would you kind of, you know, unveil all these um, kind of shenanigans and the clientelism and, you know, the territorialism and so on. Um, and that kind of very much mirrored what was happening at the time as well with the Northern Irish Assembly. And obviously it collapsed during your research in 2017, wasn't it, you know, with mm -hmm. the Irish language legislation and the Renewable Heat Initiative. Uh, and it collapsed again in 2022 with the protocol and the kind of demographic change as well and Sinn Féin being the biggest party. And now it's going to, you know, kind of resume again. So I guess what are the lessons maybe for the new assembly or what are, what are the hopes, if there is any, for the future uh, from your experience doing this research? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm unsure, you know, I'm unsure whether the status quo will change. I think, you know, there's just this long kind of history that you can trace of the DUP's intransigence on issues, whether it be housing at Girdwood, whether it be, um, you know, supporting an Irish Language Act, whether it be, you know, the protocol issue. Um, and Sinn Féin has kind of grudgingly compromised um, to the detriment of its constituents in order to keep the, the institutions afloat. But you know, that's all, that's all collapsed. I'm not, I'm not sure what to expect if that, if that will change. You know, I think, um, I think that identity politics are, are so much part and parcel of that. But on the other hand, I think, you know, people are less and less uh, supportive of identity politics. People are fed up with the politicians. Um, and so, you know, the, the, this past month, and, and we, were, we were there, there was the, uh, a strike of 
what, 150,000 mm -hmm. public sector workers. Um, and so to the extent that the DUP and Sinn Féin can recognize that it's not about identity politics anymore, it's about ensuring that people you know, receive a fair wage for their labor and are not in a cost of living and health crisis, a mental health crisis, um, you know, that people can have a quality of life. Uh, if, if, if that shifts and they recognize that that's, that's what's at the heart of politics for, for people, I think you know, there's hope. Um, I, I see, you know, every time I go back to Belfast, I feel so much optimism just in terms of, you know, there hasn't been an assembly and there's been a political vacuum at the, the political level, but in terms of what's happening with street politics, I, you know, you've seen incredible organizing and work being done on the ground um, in the absence of the assembly around issues like equal marriage and bodily autonomy and Irish language, minority language rights, um, housing justice, you know, the work of PPR and Dram Jarig, other groups, uh, that is really, really inspiring. And that is, re and I, I use that, that word genuinely, I think it's often thrown around. But, you know, the work that people have done collectively in Northern Ireland on the ground, that's, that's what really gives me hope. And so hopefully the politicians can catch up and, and learn something. Um, Let's hope. We'll see, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. Round of applause. Thank you. I, I think everybody will agree that both Liz and Ellie have done a brilliant conversation there and have really drawn out some of the breadth of the book. And, and I do um, encourage everybody to um, buy a copy later on if, if you can, if you can afford it. Um, so. Um, this brings us now to the the Q and A session. So, what I'd like um, people to do, if you if you've got a question, put your hand up, and then if I select you um, to ask a question, if you can just say who you are, please, that'd be really helpful. So, and I'm going to do this in in groups. So, there's a gentleman at the back, there's um, somebody there, and somebody over there. So, that's the first three. I'll start with. It's just the top of my head, really. Processes whereby normally Northern Ireland local plan like here and the community involved in the strategy. So, did you have any thoughts on uh, how communities have been equitably allowed to comment on uh, this site? It's a master plan, is it? It's a master plan that emanates from the local plan requirements for housing. Obviously, it's more complex than the political situation. But, uh, you know, as you mentioned before, Liverpool being locked out in the years. It's interesting about uh, you mentioned the American complex like LA, for instance, and that huge city on the outside is being built as a locked out from normal traditional uh, inputs into decision making, massive homelessness, San Diego, and all that. So that's extreme. Uh, but in terms of the statutory consequences of Northern Ireland, have you seen any reflection of that from the community initiatives uh, and the spice of politics, the housing in particular? Do you, want, do you want to answer that one to start off with, and then we'll, I'll take the other yeah, two? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, the, the a couple things come to mind. Um, you know, there were many points during this Girdwood development process where that kind of, you know, input and process should have occurred and didn't. Um, you know, again, in the in the Northern Ireland Act, there there was something called an equality impact assessment, and that was supposed to be done on every policy. It was meant to really be a, a key part of governance and streamlined into um, the process. And it, it didn't it didn't happen at all um, at the f at the first phase. It happened very laterally and kind of in a, a, tech, a tick box fashion in the second phase. Um, the other thing that was interesting uh, with the community hub idea was that, you know. Um, with private investment, you know, the economic crash, there was no private investment really available anymore, and the council saw this EU funding, and they were like, right, this is the only game in town. So they kind of threw the, the application in with, without necessarily much idea of whether it would succeed or not. And um, the EU had hired an independent set of appraisers to look at the plan. And I, I, had a, I got a copy of the appraiser's notes, and they noted, you know, serious problems with this, this blueprint because they said not not a single community group or resident around the site has been consulted. Um, uh, yeah, so the, this community hub was, didn't have any community input as to what should be in it or what kind of targeted resources might be needed. So, so there were opportunities, but they just they, they weren't taken. Yeah. 
that's interesting there. So it was the professional master planners who came in and, and did this. Okay, um, <coughs> next question. Um, I was just wondering sort of how under the rug almost do you think the uh, entrenchment of divisions is in Northern Ireland? So I, like, it's very hard to change electoral borders, for example, in Northern Ireland, whereas you've got um, projects like the Grand Road Parks and the Mona Bypass as well as sort of operations to keep those entrenchments in place, if that makes sense. So sort of like how, you know, has that reflected political change as well? I think, I think there's lots of, one thing that I really sought to do with this book was to look into kind of the, the backroom dealing, so to speak, around a lot of these projects, which are, are trotted out as ostensibly, you know, um, shared space or, you know, capital improvements, but they have this undercurrent <coughs> underneath of sectarian trade-off, you know. Um, so that was something that I wanted to document and, you know, record in an academic publication that this, this really does happen. Like, we all know it happens, we all talk about it, and it happens in every society. Like, there's always political deals and trade-off, uh, but I think it's particularly pernicious in Northern Ireland because, you know, behind the rhetoric there's always that that kind of resource competition, like zero sum game. And, you know, uh, if there's money put into one area, there has to be the same amount of money put into the other area, even though they, the needs might not be the same. Um, so that's what I see in terms of like the, the deal making idea of it. Okay, and a question from the back. First of all, thank you so much for such a wonderful, fluent discussion conversation about an incredibly exciting project and book which I very much would like to read but I'm not quite sure whether or not I can afford it yet. Um, I have to have a conversation with my husband about that. Um, <laughs> but before then, um, there are an awful lot of things I really would love to address but it'd be awfully selfish of me. So just a, a few uh, instead. So on the point that the young gentleman uh, just made about reflections of, um, what do you say, um, shoved under the rug to sectarianism. Um, from a less cynical perspective, there had been um, occasions where policies for housing were made, in case, for example, like Armagh and Katie, whereby there were streets that had so many Protestants or so many Catholics on it. And let's say one of the houses were vacated, there was an intentionality to put the same you know, denomination of a person or people in those houses. But nevertheless, it still worked out unfairly because would have uh, quite typically um, large Catholic families that really needed houses uh, but couldn't get them because you know, they were too far down the list uh, and other um, people from uh, Protestant backgrounds who you know, were retired or um, childless in the sense that they really had to be flown the coop or whatever and so it kind of works out in that way as well. Um, and I'd be interested from a religious perspective or an ethno-religious perspective about your considerations around um, the religiosity of um, certain sects of Protestantism, which is in fact quite zero-sum um, in terms of the fact that if you're having a really good time, that means there's somebody else probably not having a very good time, that there's really not enough to be shared out amongst everyone. Um, <coughs> and also, I'm really interested to know what your thoughts would be about <coughs> conversations around this official history that's been you know, um, discussed about being written around Northern Ireland. Uh, perhaps we don't know about that. Well, yeah, there's an official history party going to be written about Northern Ireland, <laughs> um, which has a cross community collaborative um, go ahead, and the Irish government is extraordinarily unhappy about it. Uh, but there are many conversations going on in the background at present. Um, but perhaps, if you don't know about it, what are your thoughts on the idea of an official history being written at all? I mean, an official, I mean, that's, that's like a very loaded question. Paraphrase those questions. Some of us didn't catch them all. Would you mind? Okay, so this, this one, um, we've just talked to the, the, the latter part of the question. Um, we started to talk about the housing policy and the, the unfairness of that in terms of the scale of the need of different parts of the community um, and the zero-sum game because there's not enough resources anyway in, in the area. 
Um, but I think on the religious, religi I can't say that word either, the religiosity <laughs> phase of this, but also the official history being written, um, which is something that has just been brought into the discussion, um, and which I think is quite an interesting one to answer. I mean, I have to say, my, my housing expertise really lies only in Belfast, which is kind of its own, you know, in terms of like uh, rural housing, I think is another, has their own kind of um, particular needs. But it does make me think, you know, just in terms of another part of this book that, that I think is kind of relevant is this idea of housing need and what that actually means. Because, you know, the housing, the housing authority in Northern Ireland terms objective need as, you know, need of a new build home. Whereas um, at particular points in the Girdwood development process, the, the DUP ran housing for a while and their definition of housing need was not, they, they actually moved to redefine it away from objective need and more towards uh, differential deprivation, which meant, you know, um, putting out overcrowding and homelessness on one hand as commensurate with declining, dispirited kind of reinvestment into Protestant unionist communities. And so what ended up happening was that money was directed towards Protestant unionist neighborhoods that had a lot of dereliction, that had, you know, um, unfit housing conditions and reinvesting in them in the hopes that people would then move back. Um, and money was diverted <laughs> away from new build social housing, which would then ostensibly be for nationalist Catholics. Um, so yeah, figuring out what does housing need actually mean and how that can be twisted by different, you know, politicians and, and elites for their own, uh, you know, their own purposes was one thing that I looked at, but in the Belfast context. Um, now, I don't know about an official history. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. <laughs> Sounds scary. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably, it'll probably be my first thought. Okay, well, well, we'll move to the next batch of questions and maybe people may have some comments on that as well in the audience. So there's a gentleman there, a lady there, and then uh, we've got Pete who yeah. has probably got something to say about that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, um, simple question. Um, how would you spend the three billion that's just arriving? How would you spend the three billion that's just arriving? I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's a simple question. <laughs> I mean, pay increase for public yeah. sector worker. Pay increases for public sector workers. That's mm -hmm. resolving the you know uh, welfare, the kind of um, you know health issues. You know, like how like lists. You know, uh, for hospitals. You know, nurses need increase. Uh, I mean, it's a bit dramatic at the moment. So yeah, but I think public sector um, pay rise is going to be a big one. Yeah. What about the power structure who would decide and stick for purpose to decide? Who would decide? Is there a plan? Will there be a plan and a framework? That's the answer. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think if we had the answer to that, we'd, we'd, be, in, we'd be in much better shape. But. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move to the lady at the back there. So firstly, um, I don't work in the same conditions that are that are evident in Belfast in terms of the conflict, but firstly, <coughs> you say that's a lost opportunity, and it would appear it is, given when you look at the plan and, and the com commentary you've given about um, the other facilities in the area, what do you believe should have been on the site? And secondly, was there any private sector interest? W would somebody have gone in there, private mm -hmm. developer gone in and built out anyway? Okay, just again to paraphrase for those who maybe didn't hear the question, so um, an, another town planning based question, thinking about the site assembly of the housing and how um, Liz described that as a lost opportunity. The question is, well, what should have been on that site in, in your opinion and also what level of engagement and interest from the private sector um, was there in the development? Yeah, well, in short, I would say build more housing. There should have been more housing. You know, I, I got a comment from a reader on the manuscript, and they were like, what is, this book, what is this book really about in a statement? And I was like, if nothing else, it was a failure because there needed to be more housing. And I think 
in terms of just targeted engagement to figure out what does what do these neighborhoods actually need for resources and how can we support that you know there's a housing crisis there's a mental health crisis and what are what are services that we can build to better serve people um, but we were talking about this idea of public sector uh, investment earlier, and I don't know if you want yeah, to... Yeah, I think we, we kind of talk quite a lot about this because the other projects, uh, kind of regeneration projects in Belfast, and I'm thinking, you know, the Titanic Quarter or even, you know, the Lagan Side Gas Works, which are in the kind of city centre, side of the city centre, Victoria Square, uh, the Cathedral Quarter, which is now Tribeca, Belfast, you know, to kind of imitate uh, New York. <laughs> Sounds lovely. Um, these projects were very much more about entrepreneurialism, so they were about this kind of neoliberal peace process, which is you had this transition to peace, but you also had this transition to neoliberalism, which weirdly enough, Northern Ireland was partly shielded from during you know, the troubles, not, not fully, but a lot of this was accelerated on the peace. And so I think the best way to kind of describe it was that you know, in, in an article, Merton McFerrin said, Northern Ireland is a toxic mix of sectarianism and neoliberalism. And I think in some of the city centre, you see the neoliberalism aspect. While in Girdwood, because maybe there was no interest, it was outside of the city centre, it could not be used for foreign direct investment and so on, sectarianism kind of prevailed in the policy and planning of it. So I think that's the way I would kind of answer it. Maybe they, because you see this kind of, um, so it's been far less investment in like West Belfast, in those kind of working class areas that actually really need it. And this investment is more about tourism and kind of big um, corporations that might bring, you know, stuff that are doing, I don't know, like legal services and so on, which is also a huge issue in a kind of population where three thirds of the population does not have, you know, qualifications above NVQ level three. So there's a lot of kind of issues with that type of peace process. And I think Girdwood's an example of where maybe sectarianism more than neoliberalism was the main kind of input, I would say. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Pete? Okay. Uh, not everything's about sectarianism. Would you agree with me? One of the problems in the areas that you worked in is that certain groups are the private landlords, as in certain people who may at one time have been involved in certain violence, yeah. or that they are uh, members of political parties, because that's one of the things. There's, there's a campaign at the minute, as you know, in West Belfast, which is actually about uh, rents being too high. Yeah. And people are going to a certain political party, mm -hmm. and they say, we will talk to the landlords, which would basically be them talking to themselves. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm glad you brought this up. It's something that... It's something that I talk about in the book, and again, that I really wanted to document and put into writing. These are things that we talk about, um, you know, we talk in euphemism about, but the fact that paramilitaries very much still control some of these areas um, to the detriment of everyone that lives in them is a, is a huge problem. Um, and so I do, you know, I write, and, and you know yourself, like, you know, you read my thesis. Uh, um, I, do, I do a lot of research on to what extent paramilitaries have control in communities and how that impacts places like the Girdwood Community Hub. I mean, I remember being at, at the launch of the hub and afterwards seeing a video that some of the community groups had made and they had interviewed young people in the area and they said, you know, paramilitaries, they give us a bad image of each other. They want us to stay away from each other. Um, so, yeah, they're... they're Could, can I just add to that? Yeah, yeah, sure. What interest, because of what morphed out of the conflict was there was a lot of cash. So you're not buying Semtex, you're not buying weapons, etc. Mm -hmm. okay. A lot of that clearly went into investment. Okay. What interest would those people have in there being social housing? If we built lots of social housing, the private sector market would collapse. So I still think one of the problems is it's not just sectarianism, is that neoliberalism is actually being driven by people who are gamekeeper and poacher. And they're talking about social justice and housing, but they're actually running the private housing market. Yeah, yeah. Not the government, it's not middle class people, it's not people who have their own road are buying these houses. It's people who live in those communities. They're telling the communities that, the, and politically, they're telling the communities, we're going to solve the housing crisis, but you're actually creating the housing crisis. Yeah. Is there a consciousness about that amongst people who live in those areas? I'm not sure. It didn't come up in my research, um, you know, to a to a measurable extent and so you know but I think I think it's a fair point I think you know building social housing that people are not going to profit from is 
is, you know, social justice orientated and it is like, you know, in keeping with the prescriptions of the peace process. But again, it just goes to show how in practice the, the scruples of the peace process have failed miserably. I research that on people when they're setting a home, say the mother dies or the father dies, mm -hmm. and they, they don't live in the area, certain people visit their houses and tell them who they're selling the house to. Yeah. Hand them a card with a solicitor who will do the conflict. Yeah, it's a fair point, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad to, say, to see that you've done research on it as well, because again, I think it's something that we talk about a lot, but it's not always documented, and I think it needs to be documented. I think it serves as well about all the interconnectivity of all these issues uh, that are out there. There was a gentleman with stripy jumper on who had his hand up. Related to two other questions, really, was, was the site identified in the development plan? What's the, who is the planning authority there? Is it Belfast uh, City Council or is it some other organisation or a, a central government organisation? If it was identified in the development plan, what, was it, what were the thoughts of the people who may have been consulted on the development plan, on the development of that particular site? I'll put the picture as well. Okay. So th this is another planning question. Was, it, was this in the development plan? Yeah. Yeah, the, the consultation process was, was really flawed. I mean, at the, in the second phase of development, it was the Belfast City Council that put forth this vision of the hub. Um, and, you know, during my field work, during the time I was in Belfast and, and going to these community meetings, um, the idea was to have this leisure center. And the idea at one point was that it would be staffed by community groups and that they would run the youth space, run the playing fields, et cetera. Um, and then I remember being at one meeting and a city council official came in and he said, well, actually, we're going to have this private leisure provider run all of our leisure centers, including the Girdwood Hub. Um, and, you know, the whole room was in uproar because this had kind of just come out of nowhere that, in fact, the, a private provider was going to be ride, running this community hub um, ostensibly. I took this picture. It's a terrible photo. I am known as an awful photographer, and this is a perfect example. <laughs> it was raining, to be fair, and I, I was, you know, I had been walking for quite some time, but I took it because I thought this was very funny. It's an advert for the gym run by this private leisure provider, and it says one shared space. And so I thought it was very funny, this idea that this, this community hub, which had been put forth, you know, as a shared space um, through, you know, no community consultation was now run by, by a private provider. Um, so what was the allocation in the development plan for, for the site? Anything? Just leisure or housing or...? There was, so there was the leisure center, there were playing fields, um, a, a couple, that, that 60 houses toward the back. And then towards the front of the site, there was meant to be 60 houses for the, you know, closer to the unionist side of the development. Those were never built. Um, and then there's actually, if you go by today, there's a huge amount of mixed use. It was zoned for mixed use land and it's never been developed. It's completely vacant. There's talks now about building a swimming pool or an indoor uh, Olympic quality sports center. Um, on the site, but those, but there's no money to do it, and so that's just been in limbo for years. Like that, the, the land has just been vacant. So, okay, I'm conscious of the time, and I had two hands up at the back: the gentleman in the red scarf, and then the gentleman behind him. And then I think we'll probably need to to wrap up, but there'll be time to have a chat with Liz outside during the re the refreshments, if that's that's okay. certain ongoing difficulties. I'm thinking here in terms of loss of life through suicide. And you mentioned North Belfast. And you haven't talked, forgive me, we haven't talked about that, which is maybe a good thing, but that would be one outcome. So one maybe should not be too surprised there might be some other difficulties. I don't know to what extent this is urban as opposed to rural. It might be interesting. Again, using Pete's reference, he talked about certain people. I love that name for those certain people. And if I get Seamus Heaney into the conversation, at one point, his nom de plume was in Curtis, uncertain. Heaney, like Carson, this is Kieran Carson, writes, if not on Girdwood, but were they here, they might do so, on ethnography and topophilia. Because the love of place is something which is very, very important to most people, but certainly to those from the north of Ireland. And I think that's something which certainly would encourage me the next time if I have a walking space, I'll go to Gurdwood. 
But equally, I'll go to Armagh, I'll go to Derry, and I'll see where there have been successes, because there has to be another side to this coin. So thank you. Yeah, there, there, there are certainly regeneration projects that have been more successful, and I think that they have been done in places where there has been less contest. Um, you know, you can look at the Ebrington Barracks and Derry, which have experienced, you know, a fairly successful by all kind of measures regeneration. Um, I do, I, I like that you invoke um, literature as well into this and that love of place. Uh, just as an aside, I, 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 I really like um, Karen Carson's work. And he had this way of describing North Belfast, which I just feel, um, you know, I, I have to mention frictions, factions, and fractions was the way he described the way, this, the, the surface, the topography of the landscape there. So um, anyway. OK, was there, a, was there another question? Yeah? Um, I just wondered what would have prevented um, Girdwood site simply being turned over to private development from the Department of Social Housing at the time So, so what would have determined the private sector taking the priority rather than the public sector from a housing perspective? Is that what you mean from a housing perspective? Yeah, no, in terms of a council decision. I mean, I'll chip in there. I mean, partly it's whether the private sector <coughs> would want to do, to do that and whether there is an incentive for them to, to do that. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, the funding probably wouldn't have been open to, to the private sector. I mean, at the, time, at the time, nobody really wanted to touch North Belfast. This was after the Holy Cross disputes. It was, it was right in the wake of the Holy Cross disputes. Um, it was, North Belfast was a powder keg. It wasn't really attractive to private investment. So the fact that the first phase of development, you know, was even courting this idea of a mixed-use site was, was something. Um, but... I don't know if you want to add anything on the private sector. I know we kind of, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the first place that investors would go in Belfast because it was there was just it was so problematic. There were so many uh, contentions there, um, and again, there had been various disputes um, in the months previous to the, the site opening. Yeah, probably something about the land values and what actual price they'd get for the houses might have you know there there were other more profitable places in in other parts of the city. So I'm just going to, there's a gentleman at the front in the blue jumper. Yeah, I'll give you a chance. Yeah, last one. <laughs> um, is the passion you talked about, the passion that you had, and the level of engagement with the communities that you, you were researching. Um, I was wondering about the possible tension between academia and activism. And it, it sounded as though there was a real activist in you, you know, in terms of wanting to be there on the front lines. Did you, did you have that opportunity, or...? Did you find that being an academic researcher created a barrier there, a tension there? So, so just so for those who can't hear that really interesting question about tensions between academic research and activism and, and was any of that present? The reason that, one reason, that I won't go on, but one reason I ask is because obviously it's, it's through activism that things might, that will help change. I'm never quite convinced that academic activity about a great deal of change. That's yeah. Just a few points. Um, it's something I always noticed and wanted to kind of bridge the gap between academia and activism because I'm not an activist. I, I have always been more of an observer and so, you know, I was able to document the work that other people were doing and hopefully kind of, you know, uh, support or, or create resources for people that were actually doing the work. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I was just writing about it. And I feel very fortunate that with this book coming out that, that there have been activists that have been really supportive and interested in the publication and able to kind of use it to move forward their, their own campaigns and conversations. Um, and so I think in that way, activism and academia can, can build on each other. Um, but Ellie, you know, you also have a lot of experience yeah, here. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. And it goes back to some of the question that the gentleman said as well, you know, where there's, there's also hopeful stuff happening. And I work with, you know, kind of community groups, cooperatives, worker cooperatives that are kind of trying to do that regeneration from the ground up, you know. Um, and being an activist and a practitioner before I did my research, I, I very much understand a kind of friction. 
And the one thing I would say is the more I kind of integrated into academia and I started doing research, the more I realized that what they needed was this academic research. You know, so it's great to have street credentials and, you know, it's like, you know, a scar that you, <laughs> you, you wear, but it's like eventually you kind of need that amplification chamber that academia provides, especially when you're dealing with politicians, because it will matter to them that this is Dr. De Jong. And it's stupid, of course, but that's, you know, what you're playing with. And so I think, you know, as far as I try to redistribute resources, participate, and I think Liz did that a, a lot as well, participant observation is a way to kind of give back your time to kind of redistribute institutional resources to the community. But as far as you do that, you also need that kind of academic space where you're kind of having a voice, um, I would say. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great answer and, and a great um, place to end um, the in conversation and, and just really want to thank Liz and Ellie for, who've been brilliant um, and I must recommend the book, it's such a fascinating read and I think as we've um, heard from the questions as well, it hooks into a lot of other different areas that you can dive into within the book. So um, please um, make your way outside and there's some refreshments waiting for everybody. Thank you. <laughs>